with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you uh, for this opportunity we have to meet together and study your creation once again. We pray that you'd uh, keep the tornadoes from forming so we can do math. And uh, just help us to understand the uh, definition of the Lebe integral today, Lord. You know, I pray. Amen. All right. So, um, yeah, what I was, I think what I got stuck on in terms of the Riemann integral last time was, you know, my um, understanding of the definition of Riemann integral is based in terms of a limit, um, a limiting procedure of, um, you know, picking sample points of subintervals at random, right? Something, something like that. And, um, in contrast, you're telling me that inter the Riemann integral is defined in terms of, you know, taking, looking at families of upper or lower sums that, you know, bound something in between, and then some sort of pinching argument says that thing exists, and whatever that thing is, is the Riemann integral. Well, <clears throat> so I, I, I decided to look in um, Stalas Hilly and um, Etchen's 10th edition calculus book, because they actually have you know, a, a pretty lengthy discussion of these things at the level of calculus too, believe it or not. And um, what I found in there was that they defined, they said that the definition that's given in volume one is the Darbo integral. So using like upper and lower sums to pinch something in the middle is that that idea was introduced by Darbo somewhere between 18, 1870s or something late, maybe 18, between 18, 70 and 1910, somewhere in there. I forget exactly. Obviously before LeBay. And then I, I, my sort of surface level interpretation of what's going on here is that the LeBay construction is essentially like taking what Darbo did and making it a little bit better and a little bit more, you know, well, general. Um, and, you know, this, this, these notions of almost everywhere and the measurability, that there's something genuinely new added there, right? But in spirit, it's really more close to the Darbo notion, I think, than the breaking things up into boxes and taking the limit as the number of boxes goes to infinity, picking random sample points, which I would say is the Riemann definition. Um, <clears throat> so, and it, it, it pretty much says that. Well, not, it doesn't say that. It doesn't, it, I, Salas and Hilly doesn't say anything about um, almost nothing about LeBay, if anything. It just talks about integration, of course, because it's a Calculus 2 book, right? But my point is simply that I think the definition that's given in Volume 1 of this series, the Princeton Lecture Series, is a good, I mean, it's a good definition. It's not, it's not illogical. It is true, what you said, that the Darbo, the Darbo integral is equivalent to the Riemann integral. That's true. But the setup of it the actual mechanics of it is much more closely tied to the integral of simple functions than, I, I think, than, than just the sort of, to me anyway, it's a matter of taste, right? Because they're logically equivalent, so, you know. <clears throat> All right, let me get started. Um, All right, so let's continue. So we're, we're working on theorem 1.5, <clears throat> which was that the integral, <coughs> I'm sorry, <coughs> suppose f is Riemann integrable on the closed interval. A to B, all right, then F is measurable and the integral in the Riemann sense, which again, um, I, I think there's technically another step to prove there. You need to prove that the Riemann integral is equivalent to the, uh, to the Darbo integral. And that is done in Salas and Hilly in a lot of detail, if you're interested. And I think it's also done in volume one 
of this series, if I'm not wrong. I haven't looked carefully to see if it's there, but I would, be, I, would, I would expect it's probably there as well. But again, if you're interested in a lower level source, looking at Darbo versus Riemann, Salas, Hilly, and Etgen, Calculus, 10th edition. It's a really, really good book. Anyway, um, <clears throat> all right, so how do we prove this? Um, I started to indicate last time, and you know, so <clears throat> essentially the point is that we can construct step functions, right? Are these step function actually, or are these simple functions? I can't remember. Yeah, there's, yeah, you're right, step functions. Um, there's step functions where um, they're bounded, right? All right, and that's of course for all x and a, b, and for k greater than or equal to one. And I guess the first order of business is this is this is equation two here. He points out that the limit as k goes to infinity of the Riemann integral from a to b d k of x dx equal to, oh, and so this is, this goes back to, you know, um, you know, you're looking at a family of upper versus lower sums, and the limit they're supposed to agree, and that they agree on is the integral. And that's why this is equal, because this is the this lower sums, and what I'm about to write is the upper sums, right? And Darbo says that those both converge on the unique quantity which defines the integral for appropriate functions, right? And so, and that, and that, by definition, is the integral, Riemann integral from a to b of f of x dx. So I would say equation two is essentially the definition of Darbo integrability, which is again equivalent to Riemann. And um, <clears throat> he says, okay, so first it follows immediately from the definition for step functions that the Riemann and LeBay integrals agree for step functions, right? So this is two. We also have equation three, which says that, guess what? Term by term, we get agreement, like integral of phi k of x is equal to the integral of phi k of x and the integral of psi k of x is equal to the integral of psi k of x. You might think I'm saying nothing. That's because I'm not done writing yet. Right. So on the left-hand side, perhaps Riemann, and the right-hand side, LeBay, all over the closed interval. And that, that is just the definition um, I mean, this is very silly, but if you think about upper and lower sums to approx I mean upper lower sums the upper and lower sums in the Darbo notion, they're you know steps above or steps below the thing you're integrating, which approximate it, right? So when, when you're approximating a step function, it's analogous to like asking what's the best, uh, what's the Taylor series for uh, x cubed plus 3x plus 2 centered at 0? 
you know, it, it, it is that. <laughs> it's already its own Taylor series. I mean, this, this is already serving as the upper and lower sums. I mean, the, the, it, it, not only is it the limit, it, it is, I don't know how to even put it into words. It, it already is an upper and lower sum, um, this or that. You know, the limit is kind of boring in this, in this context over the possible upper and lower partitions. And on the flip side, well, that agrees with the definition of Lebay integral, right? Because we just took the measure of the set times the, um, well, I guess you got to break it up into pieces, right? But, um, I mean, it doesn't have to be a single step is my point, right? The step function is not a single step, it's a bunch of steps, right? I mean, it's a finite number of steps of given values, unmeasurable <clears throat> domains. Sorry, I saw lightning. All right. Let me move along. And it has been pointed out I only have three class periods left. So it has been, it has been pointed out. Okay, so. <coughs> <coughs> So <clears throat> he says, let V tilde of x be the limit as k goes to infinity of V k of x. And psi tilde of x, you guessed it, the limit as k goes to infinity of psi k of x. All right? Note. By their construction, we have that phi tilde is less than or equal to f is less than or equal to psi tilde, right? Because of the, um, this over here, right? So this gives us that inequality. And he says, okay, but moreover, both psi tilde and phi tilde are measurable since they're the limit of step functions, right? measurable since they're the limit of step functions. All right. What next? Ah, now we can apply the bounded, uh, bounded convergence theorem, right? And the bounded convergence theorem said what? It allows us to take the limit as k goes to infinity of the Lebesgue integral over the closed interval from a to b of phi k of x dx and trade it for what? We can, the, the bounded, the bounded uh, convergence theorem says we can pass the limit from outside to inside for step functions, right? And so passing the limit inside, we get the limit of phi k of x, which is just and of course that's just he doesn't write it this way. I'm writing it this way because it makes me happy. So whatever. There you go. And likewise what? Also, again, by the bounded monotonic, um, not, excuse me, not monotonic, bounded convergence theorem, the integral, limit as k goes to infinity, the integral from a, uh, integral over the closed integral a to b in the Lebesgue sense of the sequence of step function psi k of x dx just works out to integral, man, this is a lot to write, v tilde of x dx. Goodness gracious, so much writing. They look like so, they look like such small equations when I look at them on the page, but when I find myself writing them, <laughs> there's so much to write. Anyway, there you go. So this, he says, okay, so these two things we just wrote together 
and I, I forgot to label this altogether as three. All right, so he says you take those two things and you put them together with two and three. What does that give us? <clears throat> I'm too close to the board to see it. You tell me. Mm -hmm. Oh, I guess we can, basically 3 says, what does 3 say? 3 says we can do what? We can erase R and replace it with L. That's what 3 says. That's what 3 says. And then what is the... What does the bounded monotonic, uh, I keep saying monotonic, bounded convergence theorem say to us? We can take these limits, and what is this? This is integral of phi, oh, good job, phi tilde of x dx, yeah, in the Lebesgue sense. And this integral of phi tilde of x dx, again, over AB in the, in the LeBay sense. And they're both equal to that. So what does that, what does that tell us? Well, he says from that, and I think you'll believe this, hence the integral in the LeBay sense over A to B of the difference of psi tilde of x and phi tilde of x dx is equal to zero, right? But then he points out flash flood warning. I I think we're going to be okay from the flash flood here. Should be all right, right? If there is a flash flood that is a problem for the fourth floor of DeMoss, it doesn't matter. We should just keep doing the math. There's really nothing else to do. <laughs> this was built. This was built after Noah's Ark. <laughs> the biology department made us make it make it a floatable building. Oh, is that right? So DeMoss, why have I never heard this? The things you, so, 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 I, now that you say that, having gone to the, uh, what's it, Ark Encounter? You guys been to this? It's up in, I think, Kentucky, it's uh, Ken Ham's. Big wooden. I mean, they have built a a scale replica of the ark. It's uh, it's really really something. You've never seen this much wood in one place. I think it's the largest wooden structure on earth, if I remember right. I mean, it's it's wow. Um, <clears throat> so many well behaved Amish children in there. Like you've never seen more better behaved like large families. It's it's really something to behold. But um, anyway, now that you mention it. That is about the same size as this building. Yeah, interesting. <clears throat> I did not know that. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to get to a point here. So this is given to, by, you know, by construction, that's greater than or equal to zero. And so that means that psi tilde minus phi tilde is greater than or equal to zero. And then he says, by the observation, following the proof of the bounded convergence theorem, we conclude that um, psi tilde minus phi tilde is equal to zero almost everywhere. Um, 
And so what does that tell us? In other words, so P tilde equals to psi tilde equals to F almost everywhere. And what's that prove? So what does that mean? F is the limit of a sequence of step functions. Therefore, F is measurable, right? And by what I've already written, you can see that the Riemann integral of F agrees with the LeBay integral of F, which is what we wanted to show. Okay? So. Let us go on to stage three. <laughs> What's stage three? He says, we, pr we proceed with integrals of functions that are measurable and non-negative, but not necessarily bounded. That means that the functions are allowed to be extended valued. Um, so these functions could take the values infinity uh, it could take the value of infinity on, on some measurable set. All right. And again, when we talk about supremum in here, the supremum could be infinity if the set's unbounded, right? The infimum could be minus infinity if the set is not bounded below. These are definition of soup and in, inf in the context here. Um, but in, in this context, the, for, um, let's see here, for f, what I say? f measurable. Not necessarily bounded. Right? Because the stage two was what? Measurable and bounded, right? That was what we just did. Stage two was measurable and bounded, right? Um, so measurable and bounded, we were able to <clears throat> define the Lebe integral. And so here, not too different. Here's the definition. The integral, come on, integral of f of x dx um, is equal to the supremum so over g of the integral of g of x dx. What is the, where is he says this is the extended LeBay integral. Trouble with spelling. Where, where, where the supremum taken over all measurable functions, G, um, such that zero less than or equal to G less than or equal to F. And what's the deal with G? G is bounded. Um, and supported on a set of finite measure. So that actually takes me back to stage two, right? That was actually what we defined in stage two, wasn't it? it was how to integrate we talked about support at the start of stage two, and um, we, we discussed the fact that um, if you have a bounded function supported on a set of finite measure, and then you could find a sequence of special functions, uh, simple functions rather, bounded by M, supported on E, such that they converge to X, right? That was lemma 1.2. 
Um, and then we looked at that adding zero argument and fussed with the, uh, the integration over a sub epsilon and the complement by a sub epsilon, went through all that stuff. And eventually we defined the Lebesgue integral of such a function, uh, again, supported, um, bounded supported on a set of finite measure by the limit as n goes to infinity of the step functions which, which represent said function. And then we, then we talked about why that, that limit should be unique a little bit. And then ultimately that allowed us to you know, do, do this. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So what I'm trying to say is each one of these things, right, the integral of g of x dx is a stage two, stage two Lebesgue integral, right? And so now we're taking the supremum over all such things to define the integral um, for if it's measurable but not necessarily bounded. All right. Um, he says, with the above definition of the integral, there are only two possible cases. Either the supremum is... That is some weird... That was, that was a really weird sounding thunder, right? I mean, I think this is very strange thunder. I don't like strange sounding thunder. It comes from strange looking clouds, right? Who would think? I'm going to shut up. Let's go on. Um, so either the supremum is finite or infinite. He says, in the first case, when the integral um, is less than infinity, we say the f is Lebesgue integrable or simply integrable. So that's why he's saying it's the extended Lebesgue integral, because this definition makes sense even when that works out to infinity. But when this is less than infinity, then we say that f is Lebesgue integrable. So for f as above, such that the integral of f of x dx is less than infinity, we say, <coughs> excuse me, um, f is the bay integrable. All right. And he says, okay, and more clearly, if E is any measurable subset of RD and F is non-negative, then the integral of F times the characteristic function of E is also positive, and we'll define the integral over E of F of X dx for such a function, all right, to be the integral of F of X um, chi, chi e of x dx. Okay, so if I understand logically what's going on here, this is being defined in terms of that, which is giving meaning to this. Okay, and it gives a couple of examples, and um, he says that. And I'm not going to work on these examples because he's got better examples later that have got a lot more details that I want to get into. Um, but he, he claims here that F A, F sub A of X, um, so that's the, um, the, the length of X to the minus A power for X less than or equal to 1, the length of X less than or equal to 1, and 0 for the um, length of x greater than 1. What he says here is he says that this is integrable when a is less than d. And he also, he has another example where he says it's integrable when a is greater than d this one. If I hadn't been reminded that I only have three classes yet, I might try to get into the details of this, but I will behave and, and, and not, be, not resist the temptation at the moment. Um, 
it might be fun to think about what this means in one dimension. Like just on R. When D, so if, if D is equal to 1, what happens with this example? So it's saying that the reciprocal, so in one dimension, the, um, that just be the absolute value of x, right? So the integral of absolute value x, and it's, how's it, I mean, I can graph it in one dimension, right? So 1 over absolute value of x is just, just between 1 and minus 1, right? That's the distance 1, so... I mean, it, 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 it looks like that, right? Well, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not very, I guess it probably should go to here, right? Duh. I mean, it's got a, why is this, um, why is F measurable? Can you explain to me why F is measurable? It's, continu it's continuous except at one point. So if it's, if it's continuous except on a set of measure zero, it's measurable? It's measurable? So, the, of course, the origin has measure zero, and that's where also where the function's infinity, right? What's that? Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I was, I was asking if it was measurable. I'm sorry. Um, but if I, if I believe... I mean, I, I, I haven't, I'm not saying I've worked out this, defi this example from our current definition, but if I just think about the example 1 over the absolute value of x, right, then, whoa. Actually, this is impressive. I mean, to me, it, it, when, when, a, when a is less than 1, what's that mean? I'm sorry, I'm trying to think of, so that's 1 over absolute value of x to the, to the a, right? Oh, this is not surprising, right? So like 1 over x, if we integrate, if you do the improper integral around the origin, of course, that blows up, right? Because you get the natural log when you calculate it. On the other hand, if we have... Um, 1 over like a square root, and we'd calculate the improper integral. Amusingly, the, the seeming divergence doesn't really matter because when you take the limit, you end up with like square root, the antiderivative square root. So as you approach the, uh, the divergence, it, it's, it's, it's harmless. In other words, the, if, you, if you look at the graph, I mean, to the, to the uh, you know, casual observer, this and that kind of look the same, but if we look at y equals 1 over the square root of x, right? The area under y equals the 1 over the square root of x between minus 1 and 1 is actually bounded. Because this is an improper integral, and when you, when you, when you, when you calculate the antiderivative here, you get square root of x, and then square root of x as you're approaching you know, you do both sides separately and both sides are finite because you're just looking at square root approaching zero, which is fine. So even though, yeah, it's infinitely tall, the area bounded there is finite. In contrast, infinitely tall and also infinite area. But apparently, this stage three takes care of both cases. Like this notion of 
integration is also taking care of infinite integrals. It's, it's folding improper integrals into the discussion in the same framework. We don't need to sort of bootstrap something on top of the Riemann integral like we, when we treat improper integrals in calculus, we have to do something on top of Riemann integration to like take care of them, right? And this, it would seem to say is, I guess that's all this is, right? This is kind of just that, isn't it? It's just adding limits. But anyway, so just, I just want to make some fuzzy comments about that. Proposition 1.6 says that the stage 3 integral is still linear. Uh, it has linearity. It has additivity. It has monotonicity, as we've written down other days. And what else? It is... Um, ah. And there's a couple of... Um, but there's a... <clears throat> Four, f four, five, and six, maybe, um, of the um, stage three proposition are worth writing down. So I'll, I'll do that. I mean, I'm, we, we, I've written linearity in the additivity. I mean, I've written the other stuff before. I'm not going to be lazy. So <clears throat> part four says if G is integrable, and 0 less than or equal to f less than or equal to g, then f is integrable. That's kind of a squeeze theorem, isn't it? Um, and 5 says that if f is integrable, this one is a really useful thing to remember if you're you know, taking an honest-to-goodness class on this. If f is integrable, then, I mean, this is such a nice result. f is less than infinity for almost every x. So an integrable function can't be infinite outside of a set of measure 0. So the improperness of the integration has to be confined to a, to a set of, of measure 0, is another way of saying 5. And I'm being fuzzy there. He has not defined improper integral. 6, if ooh, the integral of f is 0, then, ooh, this is all quite beautiful, f of x is equal to 0 for almost every x. All right. So you guys doing anything interesting for Easter? Staying, staying here, going home? Going to DC, huh? Finishing all the homework for this class. You're like, where's the, uh-oh, you have a question. This is exciting. Mm -hmm. Is this a true statement? <laughs> well, that does seem like a reasonable. Is that what e to the two pi r is a part force function? There should be a two pi. It's two, 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 two pi. Two pi over five. Two pi over five in both the cosine and sine. Am I not supposed to have a two pi there? I have no idea. Ah. Uh, I mean, you can consider it whether or not the 2 is there. So um, I think it's fine. Oh, I mean, that, that what you wrote is fine, yeah, yeah. But I, if I'm wrong and you disprove it, that's also, of course, a full solution. But I don't think it's wrong. So I'm pretty sure it's not. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Let's see here. Where were we? Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, yes, 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 yes. yes. 
Ah. I feel like I've almost gotten rid of this cough. I'm not quite there yet, but I'm getting there. <clears throat> so the next lemma is important enough to have a name. It's called Fatou's Lemma. Write it down here for you. Lemma 1.7. Suppose Fn is sequence of measurable functions which are non-negative if the limit as n goes to infinity of fn of x is equal to f of x. I'm going to guess almost everywhere. Yep, for almost all x. Then the integral of f is less than or equal to the lim inf uh, as n goes to infinity of the integral of fn. Now he, he gives a cautionary example before he before he before he even states this lemma. He 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 apologizes for this lemma <laughs> not being nicer than it is. Because of the example I'm about to write down, the example I'm about to write down sort of spoils what you might hope for. Um, and the example is this. It's um, and, and so the question that's begged is, you know, um, does the integral of fn dx just go to uh, integral of f of x dx? I mean f dx in this, in this non-negative context? And the answer is no, because if we look at fn of x equal to case-wise defined n, if um, 0 less than x less than 1 over n, and, 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 and zero otherwise, if we look at this sequence of functions, um, then it is the case that fn of x goes to zero for all x, and yet the integral of fn of x tends to one for all n. Well, no, the integral of fn is, is, is literally one. Let me, let me, I think it's good to see a picture of this actually. Um, so what, what's, what's going on here? We'll start out with, um, well, I guess we could start with, here's one. So what, what's this look like? It's one. One between what? Yeah. OK, so there is, um, there's F1, right? And then, oh man, I made some very poor graphical choices in this so far. <laughs> I, I, I need to think more like this. So it starts out. There's F1, F2, looks like that, F3, is like that, you know, and up it goes. But what's the thing, every one of those, what's the... Uh,
But if you look at the integral of, you know, the, well, the integral from 0 to, to 1, of, well, n, 0 to n, 1 over n, rather, of n dx, what is that? That's nx evaluated from 0 to 1 over n, which is n over n, right? <laughs> it doesn't, I mean, it's obvious for the first one, right? That has area one, but then like the second one, it's a half, but it's too tall, you know? And I'm not going to do any more, but you get the idea. So clearly, the integral, right, the integral of fn dx is just equal to one for all n, and yet the limit as n goes to infinity of fn of x is equal to zero. Because as, as n goes to infinity, there's no x for which it's non-zero in that, in that limit. Yeah. It's very sneaky. So that rains on the parade up here, right? Fn goes to 0. The integral of 0 would be 0. And yet, this is the constant sequence, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. So apparently, we're stuck with this result. We can't say that the limit of this is f, but we can say that the integral is less than that. So in the counterexample, this, I think, is 0. I mean, the integral of the 0 function is 0, but this is 1. Is 0 less than or equal to 1? Yeah, I think so. So no trouble from this for Batao's lemma. And I think we can prove this. The question is, should I? Debatable. All right. If I get stuck, we're going on. Proof. Suppose 0 less than g less than or equal to f, where g is bounded and supported. And that, that uh, E is a set of finite measure. He says, oh, very neat. He says, let Gn of x be the minimum of G of x and Fn of x, right? Now, whenever you see somebody write minimum, you should be leery that they're actually taking the minimum of a finite set of things. Here there are two things, so we should be okay, right? Minimum of this and that, that's not a... Um, and then what? He says, well, Gn is measurable and supported on E. So this is measurable. Um, and supported on E. Do you, do you see why it's measurable? And why it's supported on E? Well, here's why it's supported on E. If G was non-zero outside of E, right? If G was non-zero outside of E, this would be troubling because G is less than F. And we know that F is 0 outside of E because F is supported on E. So that's why, that's why um, um, G is, well, I was arguing why G is supported. Why is GN supported? I guess the same reason, right? Yeah, I think um, 
Ah. Well, it's something along those lines. I think I've, I think I've argued why G is supported. I don't think I've argued why both of these, the minimum of that is supported. Can you guys tell me how to upgrade my argument for that? Well, we know that the we know that the FNs are non-negative. Um, and we know that they limit to F. I think it may be because of I mean. This intuitively says, this intuitively, look, if we, I, here's, how, here's a sort of fuzzy argument, but this intuitively says that the FNs are going to F, right? So these, these can't be, they, they can't be non-zero where F is, um, I don't, well, that's in the limit though, isn't it? Well, setting aside that for the moment, um, if we did have that, then we'd have gn of x is measured, is measurable, it's supported on E, and um, gn of x goes to, um, um, gn of x for almost every x. Do you see why that would be true, at least? So it's just kind of a, a squeeze there, right? I mean, okay. Um, oh, so then with this, then by the bounded convergence theorem, we have that the integral of gn goes to g, integral of g rather. And he says, by construction, also we have uh, but, uh, but, uh, gn less than or equal to fn by construction, and that, of course, gives us that the integral of gn, this is monotonicity, right, less than the integral of fn, and so the integral of g is less than or equal to the lim inf as n goes to infinity of fn, integral of fn. So how do we calculate the limb, the limb inf again? Is that over all possible subsequences? How does that work? Subsequences? So this, yeah, the, like it's the smallest convergent limit over all possible subsequences. I mean, whatever kind of limit would you, okay, but um, so whatever subsequence, whatever, whatever subsequence you imagine, it's this is below it, right? And so as n goes to infinity, any subsequence of gn also goes to g, right? Because if gn converges to g, the integral of gn converges to g, so does any subsequence of 
right? I mean, this is a theorem we have, right? Any convergent limit, if you take any subsequence of a convergent limit, the limit of the subsequence converges to the same limit. Am I wrong? Yeah. Well, for bounded measurable, I get it in my in the context we're in. It, okay. Um, <clears throat> and then he says, take the you take the. Um, then finally, take the supremum. He says, supremum over all G gives us that. Because that's you know we take the supremum over all such G, that's the integral of um, integral of f. Because it goes back to integral of f of x is supremum over all g, integral g of x, where g is between f and 0 like this, and g is a bounded and so, you know, bounded support on a set of finite measure like that. <sighs> I, guess, I guess there's a lot going on in this lemma, right? Um, hmm. Mm. Cool, cool. It must be that there could be trouble making subsequences of the F given the context, and we have to get rid of those troublemakers, you know? I don't have enough of an intuition here to come up with an example, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I mean, I hear what you're saying, but um, I know this book is careful enough. They wouldn't throw it in there if it wasn't needed. So if we're not understanding why it's needed in the proof, it's because we don't quite understand the proof. <laughs> Sorry, but true. Uh, corollary. <clears throat> 1.8. If we have F as a non-negative, Non-negative measurable function and um, we have a sequence of um, also non-negative measurable functions. with fn of x less than or equal to f of x. And fn of x going to f of x for almost every x, then um, the limit as n goes to infinity of the integral of fn equals the integral of f This is a corollary. So that means the proof should be easy. <laughs> is it? 